Session 3, Part B, The Addiction Process and Brain Transformation. It's good to see you all again. I hope you're learning. We're going to talk today about some scientific things that involve MRIs and neurons and synapses and things that you might not have heard of before, but I assure you that there's nothing important that you're going to hear or see that's not consistent with Scripture if it's true. So when we look at the brain function, and we look at its structure, and we consider the interplay between addiction and brain function, one of the things you might want to know is, how does the brain actually work? If you look here, we can see an MRI of brain function during thinking or observing. As a matter of fact, we can see what your brain looks like on Star Trek. I'll be right back with you. Who are you? I'm with He's him. with me. We are traveling at warp speed. How did you manage to beam aboard this ship? Hey, you're the genius. You figure it out. As acting captain of this vessel, I order you to answer the question. Well, I'm not telling, acting captain. What did... Well, no, that doesn't frustrate you, does it? My lack of cooperation. That, that doesn't make you angry. Are you a member of Starfleet? I, um... Yes. Can I get a towel? Under penalty of court-martial, I order you to explain to me how you were able to beam aboard this ship while moving at warp. Well, don't answer him. You will. All right. Hopefully you learned something there about the way the brain works when your eyes are active and when your emotions are active. Here's a functional MRI that shows how the brain changes during thought processes. And, for example, I want to show you what your brain looks like when you view pornography. So here we see the volume changes on an MRI from a process of thinking, observing, or obsessing about a subject in cross-frame and cross-section so you can see that even the anatomy of the brain changes under certain influences. So when you consider how the brain works, you might want to stop and think about how an addiction cycle might take over. So here you see we have a habit cycle where there's a stimulus or a cue, there's a behavior, a response, and then we see that loop continue through that addictive cycle with a substance or an activity. This is the habit loop that leads to any addiction or any habit. So how does the brain itself work? Well, you might consider what a cable network works like with a satellite in space that passes a signal down to a satellite dish that receives that signal, passes it through cables that go to a signaling station, that go to a central processing area in the cable company, that then go out to many homes that feed that information and visual images and audio into houses by cables. Well, our nervous system is not unlike that, and that's not a terrible comparison. We have a receiving uh, part of a neuron or a nerve cell in the brain called a dendrite. That dendrite is afferent, we say, or it feeds into the cell center, and it passes along information to the neuronal center where the nucleus is, and then the neuron cell body, the major part of the neuron, has axons, which are efferent or away from the cell body, that feed out to as many as 10,000 other cells in the brain. Now, along the way, you may see that dendrites have either the dendrites or axons or supportive cells of up to 10,000 other cells that touch them or interact with them. And this complicates and makes the brain quite an, a, a powerful processing system, as you can imagine. And we see that along the way, the cell body itself has support cells that interact with it. There are dendrons and dendrites and axons of other neurons that can contact and that influence the cell body, as well as the axons which go away. So, when you think of the complexity of the brain, we have 100 billion cells in the brain that are either neurons or they're supportive cells. There's a debate between 40 and 100 billion neurons and between 30 billion and 60 billion supporting cells. 
but for simplicity's sake, let's just say there are 100 billion neurons. Now, each nerve cell or neuron can contact or interact with up to 10,000 other cells on the dendritic side afferently coming into the cell body, up to 1,000 neurons at the cell body, and up to 10,000 more neurons on the axonal side, the efferent path away from the uh, nerve cell body, the neuron. So we see a dramatic, dramatic complexity where those 100 billion brain cells, whether supportive or active, can interact with up to 10 million other neurons in the brain. If you take a simple exponential equation, 100 billion simply to the 10,000th power would lead us to a number that was so extravagant that it would be more uh, equal to the number of stars in the heavens in complexity of the number of neuronal connections or possibilities of connecting nerve cells in the human brain. It is very nearly infinite. Each of these dendritic or axonal inputs or modifications to the nerve cell can either amplify, diminish, or transmit the signals from other cells to those cells. So now we have three more layers of complexity. It's not simply a one-to-one, -one, each neuron can only do one thing to another. These feedback systems are very complex, and each neuron has up to 1,500 neurotransmitters or chemicals that interact with other neurons, not to speak of all of the complexity of the cell body, which each neuronal cell body is more complex part for part than the entire city of Manhattan, as one of the five boroughs of New York is. So you see that the creation is truly fearfully and wonderfully made, and we're only talking about the brain. We're not yet even dealing with the interaction between the spirit and soul, or the soul and the body, in that the brain is part of the body as we've already discussed. These cell bodies alone are easily a hundred trillion times as complex as Darwin or Freud understood them. This allows you to understand why they had such a simplistic view of biology and why they believed that evolution was actually a possibility that was conceivable and that was explainable. So, you've seen brain anatomy, you've seen how the brain functions, you've seen how neurons function, You've seen some functional uh, associations of how thoughts and images and sounds affect our brain function. Again, that only is discussing the human body, only one part of uh, that that's made in the likeness of God. So the three things that I want to spend time discussing with you for the rest of our time for Session 3B are three parts of science related to brain function that were unknown that were considered heresy even as late as 1985. One is long-term potentiation, one is epigenetics, and these both make up a larger field called neuroplasticity. These are the state of the art of neurological function and how you and I can understand the amazing power that our thoughts, our attitudes, and our beliefs have on our brain function, our habit formation, our memory, and our tendency toward addiction. Not simply if we're going to be addicted, because as we've already discussed, you're going to be addicted to something. The question is what? And that is where the thoughts, the ideas, the beliefs, the ruminations, and the emotions that go with those thoughts based on what we believe come to play in our day-to-day -day life and what lead us to either a positive and helpful addictive habit or to a negative and destructive one.